Hey, 42 here. In 1981, a Parisian schoolboy was busy trying to do something schoolboys the world over have been attempting for countless generations. Impress his mates. But this particular kid was more inventive than most. He didn't claim to have been on holiday to Area 51, or to be the youngest person in history to become a black belt in karate. No, he claimed to enjoy breaking into places he shouldn't after dark. Nothing too much wrong with that, plenty of kids like bending the rules when they get the chance. But as is often the way with childhood boasts, the boy let bravado get the better of him. Because he wasn't talking about a few surreptitious cigarettes in the car park of the local leisure centre. No, he claimed the next place on his list for a little nighttime excursion was the Pantheon, which just so happens to be one of the most famous buildings in all of Paris. Built in the 18th century and originally a church, the neoclassical marvel that is the Pantheon is steeped in history. It's home to Leon Foucault's famous pendulum, with which he completed the first ever experiment demonstrating the rotation of the Earth, and today it's used as a mausoleum, housing the remains of some of France's most celebrated citizens, including Voltaire, Victor Hugo, Alexandre Dumas, Louis Braille and Marie Curie, who was born in Poland but became a French citizen later in life after moving to Paris. So yeah, much like Ron Burgundy, the Pantheon is kind of a big deal. The boy's friends were quick to call what was very obviously a bluff, but he refused to back down, which is how he and a small group of friends ended up sneaking out one night when the rest of the city was sleeping to attempt to get inside one of Paris's most famous landmarks. That should have been where this story ends, with the kids repelled by locked doors and patrolling night watchmen. This was the Pantheon, after all, but much to their surprise, getting inside was a piece of cake. Being inside was equally breezy, and the group spent the night exploring the utterly deserted national landmark to their heart's content, without ever running into even a hint of security. By the time they finally made their way blearily to bed in the early hours of the following morning, the same question had crystallised in each of their minds. Where next? In most cities, their options would be severely limited, but as you'll know if you've watched my recent video on the catacombs, Paris is no ordinary city. The tunnels that lie hidden beneath its streets are vast, at least 350 kilometres all told, and to those who know where to look, they offer secret access to the basements of private residences, government buildings, and national monuments alike. In short, the Paris catacombs are an urban explorer's pulsating nocturnal omission. And according to legend, it was during an adventure in the catacombs that our group of teenagers stumbled across a narrow tunnel packed with electrical cables, which they followed until eventually finding themselves in the basement of what turned out to be the Ministry of Communications. Again, you'd be forgiven for thinking an important government building like this would have been protected by laser sharks and trip wires. Okay, maybe not that, but at least the odd aging guard snoozing on a stool somewhere. But it seems Parisians are awfully relaxed when it comes to security, because the group were able to explore the basement of the building at their leisure. And it was there, locked away in a dusty drawer, that they were to make a discovery that would change the history of Paris's underworld forever a set of maps charting the entirety of the catacombs. For a group of budding urban explorers, it was the mother load. People had been exploring the catacombs for untold years, painstakingly mapping new areas and uncovering forgotten corners. But nobody alive had managed to build up the kind of comprehensive overview that was contained in those pages. Secret entrances to the catacombs that had been lost for generations. Entire tunnel systems, as yet unexplored. And of course, underground access points to many of Paris's most famous landmarks. Armed with this sacred knowledge, Le UX, as the group of friends would come to be known, 
have been causing absolute mayhem in Paris ever since. Fast forward to today, and LeUX, which is short for The Urban Experiment, have grown into a fully-fledged underground organization, in both the literal and figurative sense, figuratively underground because they operate under a cloak of extreme secrecy, and literally underground because it's their unique knowledge of the catacombs that has allowed them to pull off the kinds of stunts usually reserved for plot lines in Hollywood blockbusters. By the way, if the name LeUX sounds familiar, that might be because I briefly touched on the organization in my video about the catacombs. These were the guys who built an entire cinema complex deep beneath the streets of Paris, complete with bar and restaurant, where they are thought to have held film festivals and private screenings for months, maybe even years before French police eventually stumbled across the setup during a training exercise. But whilst building a secret cinema in a cave system below one of the world's great cities is pretty damn cool, it's just the tip of the LeUX iceberg. So what would you do if someone gave you what amounted to a skeleton key granting access to some of the most famous buildings in the world through a series of little known secret entrances? This is Paris we're talking about here. Pretty much everywhere you look there are priceless works of art hanging on gallery walls, cellars stocked with dusty bottles of vintage wine, and museums chock full of rare artifacts. I don't know about you, but I'd be robbing the place blind. You wouldn't be able to move in the 42 residence for Monet's and half-drunk bottles of Cheval Blanc. But not LeUX. In fact, over the last few decades, far from stealing everything in sight, they've kind of been doing the opposite. You see, they're of the opinion French officials have, at times, been a little negligent in their attitude towards the country's rich heritage, focusing tax dollars only on the upkeep of big-ticket tourist traps like the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower, whilst letting less well-known sites slowly deteriorate or even fall into ruin. So, instead of pulling off a series of art heists worthy of the Thomas Crown affair, LeUX decided to become the invisible champions of Paris's lost heritage, both above ground and below. They're responsible for secret restorations of at least one forgotten metro station, a 12th century crypt, a 100-year-old French government bunker, and a World War II air raid shelter. Of course, that kind of work takes both manpower and expertise, and LeUX has grown considerably since those early days, when it was just a group of friends having a bit of fun. Thought to be made up of at least 150 members today, the group is now split across several different units, each with its own special skills and equally special name. There's the Mouse House, who focus on infiltration, the Untergunter, who carry out covert restorations of heritage sites around the city, and La Mexicaine de Perforation, who were responsible for the secret cinema complex, as well as countless other excavations in the catacombs. But whilst the names are playful, LeUX are deadly serious in their mission of stepping in where the state is failing to take care of Paris's rich history, as well as reclaiming lost and forgotten spaces for creative expression, usually in the catacombs themselves, where they regularly host secret art exhibitions and film screenings. In 2006, a lone thief managed to waltz inside the Parisian Museum of Modern Art, helping himself to paintings by the likes of Picasso, Modigliani, and Matisse, before escaping entirely undetected. If you read the newspaper coverage at the time, you'd be forgiven for thinking this was some kind of elaborate heist pulled off by sophisticated international art thieves. But as we've seen, Security at some of Paris's most famous landmarks isn't always quite what you'd expect. And, in reality, the theft was pulled off by some bloke who ambled up to the museum in the dead of the night, broke one padlock, and smashed a single window. That was literally all it took to grant the guy access to hundreds of millions of euro worth of paintings. The robbery was nothing to do with LeUX, as I've said, they're in the business of preserving heritage, not pinching it. But they have been doing their bit to try and ensure similar robberies never happen again, 
by keeping an eye on museum security across the city and stepping in when they find issues. So collectively, they're like French Batman. But instead of causing millions of euros of property damage and hospitalizing just about everyone in sight to stop a lone baddie, Leuex prefer to fix what's broken and take a more intelligent approach to vigilantism. One member carried out a detailed audit of one of Paris's leading museums over a series of weeks, finding multiple problems with the level of security she observed. She wrote a full report on the various issues, explaining the myriad ways she could have broken into the museum and made off of some swag had she chosen to do so. When she'd finished, presumably both to save on postage and to ably demonstrate her point, she infiltrated the office of the museum's head of security in the middle of the night and left the report on his desk. You'd think the man would have been grateful for the help when he came in the next morning, if perhaps a little embarrassed by where it came from. But no, he wasn't grateful. He was angry. So angry, in fact, he went straight to the police to press charges. Talk about looking a gift horse in the mouth. The police declines to pursue the matter any further. Without a doubt, Leuex's crowning achievement, or at least a crowning achievement amongst the ones we actually know about, took place back where it all started, at the Pantheon, which, as it turns out, had become something of a second home to the members of Leuex over the years. Since that first night, the group had been back many, many times, and not just to wander around admiring the 19th century architectural flourishes. As crazy as it sounds, not content with simply infiltrating one of the city's most famous landmarks, Leuex members had, for years, been using the cavernous interior as their own private after-hours exhibition centre, hosting art installations, staging plays, and filming screenings there in the dead of the night, then clearing everything away and disappearing without a trace before the tourists turned up the next day. If you find that hard to believe, you don't have to take my word for it, because Leuex kindly went to the trouble of producing a short film of their exploits called Pantheon User Guide, in which you can watch a Leuex member in an Untergunter t-shirt enjoying a pleasant evening rollerblading around a deserted Pantheon before other team members arrive to rig up a huge projector for a private screening of American Psycho, all without staff at the mausoleum ever being any the wiser. It was probably during one of these events in November of 2005 that someone decided to go and take a look at one of the Pantheon's greatest treasures, an antique Wagner clock, which was built in 1850 to preside over a prominent entrance within the building, but had been allowed to fall into disrepair. One of Leuex's members happened to be a qualified watchmaker for renowned French horological house Breguet, and on taking a look at the piece, he discovered it wasn't simply old and dirty. Someone had deliberately sabotaged the movement, presumably to save them the trouble of winding it every day. If the Pontian administration weren't going to look after such a precious piece under their care, it was time for the Untergunter, Leuex's specialist restoration unit, to step in. But this was no simple spruce up of a forgotten crypt beneath the city. The Wagner clock was an important artifact in one of Paris's most popular buildings, visited by hundreds of thousands of tourists each year. The clock's mechanism was large and complicated, and it would need to be taken apart and thoroughly cleaned with the damaged parts repaired or replaced. And seeing as the work would have to be carried out in secret during the night, they were going to need months to complete the job, not to mention plenty of equipment more than they could simply bring in and out every night. Put all of these things together and it should have been an impossible job. But the Untergunter were more than a match for it. To kick things off, they built themselves a fully functioning secret workshop in a cavity high up in the Pantheon, hidden beneath the Great Dome, which they kitted out with armchairs, bookshelves, and a small bar. And because they love a silly name, they dubbed it the Unter and Gunter Winterkneipe, German for the Unter and Gunter Winter Boozer. 
They even set up a small vegetable garden on a terrace overlooking the city, because getting your five a day shouldn't be compromised, even if you are busy covertly restoring an aging artifact right under the nose of the French government. The restoration took almost a year, with the clock painstakingly restored to its former glory. Typically, Lei UX act in complete secrecy. We have no way of knowing how many such restorations they've made across the city. But this time was different. After all, in order for their hard work to be worthwhile, somebody was going to have to keep the Wagner clock wound. So, for once breaking protocol, Leuex surfaced, arranging a meeting with the administrator of the Pantheon to tell him the good news. You're probably thinking the man was absolutely delighted to hear an important part of the Pantheon's history had been repaired completely free of charge by a horological expert. And, rumour has it, he was, for all of about 15 seconds, at which point he didn't so much look his gift horse in the mouth, but attempted to get it sent straight to the glue factory. Apparently, coming to the conclusion, the whole thing was going to make him look incompetent. After all, not one member of his staff reported seeing anything out of the ordinary during the entire year it had taken for the team to restore the clock. The man promptly initiated legal action against those involved, with the prosecutors seeking up to a year in jail on top of almost €50,000 in damages. Despite the fact Leuex had invested some €4,000 of their own money on the restoration, the Pantheon even hired another clockmaker to undo the Untergunter's repairs, although he refused to actively damage the mechanism, deactivating it instead. Unfortunately for the Pantheon administration, it seems there are no laws in France against secretly repairing clocks in the middle of the night. So instead, they went after Leuex for something else entirely. Inside a year, four members of the Untergunter found themselves in the Paris Court of Justice, not on charges of breaking and entering, or of repairing a priceless clock, but for apparently breaking a lock somewhere on the Pantheon grounds. It was a ridiculous case in many, many ways, not least because there was absolutely no proof Untergunter members had actually broken the lock in the first place. But thankfully, the French legal system came through with flying colours on this one. After hearing the trial, the judge deliberated for only 20 minutes before revealing his verdict. Not guilty, with one of the prosecutors quoted as calling the whole case stupid. My grasp on French law is pretty basic, but I think the judge came to his decision based on reasoning along the lines of We don't guillotine the good guys, mon ami. More on ami, more like. In the kind of two-finger salute they're now famous for, Leuex infiltrated the Pantheon once more in the wake of the trial, reactivating the Wagner clock so that it would chime for a few days over the Christmas period before returning once again to remove the components they'd repaired, just in case the current administration hired anyone else to break it. What's so intriguing about Leuex is that everything we know about them, the remarkable restoration of the Pantheon clock, the mysterious security reports designed to protect important art galleries, the infiltration and the subterranean events, these things just scratch the surface of their clandestine activities beneath Paris. They are, after all, an underground organisation, and they don't publicise almost anything they do. What we do know about them has often come out inadvertently when someone they've tried to help has reacted with about as much grace as Bambi after 15 pints of Newcastle Brown Ale. On the rare occasions Leuex members have spoken to the press, they've always hinted at other equally ambitious projects they're working on that never make it into the public domain. But if you think all of this sounds like kind of a good time, I'm afraid there's no easy way of joining Glay UX. Just to add a little more to their mystique, becoming a member is by invitation only, and only those who are already involved in Lay UX like activities will ever receive an invite. So yeah, if you want to join, you basically have to go to Paris, get yourself underground sharpish, and start causing all sorts of mischief until some suave looking stranger taps you on the shoulder in a coffee shop and teaches you the secret handshake. Well, I guess that's my summer holiday sorted. 
Thanks for watching. You can now buy my new book, Stick a Flag on It, on Amazon or get the audiobook on Audible. You'll find a link to both in the description below. Thank you.